Yes, hi everyone. My name is Hadouk. Um, so this is going to be four lectures. We're, we're going to do it with Aurel. Um, he's going to take the last two lectures. We originally thought each lecture was an hour and a half. Uh, then we were told it's just one hour. So it's, it's going to be a, a more sketchy than, a, uh, than I was planning. But um, yeah, the idea is uh, we want to talk about GL2, the case of um, over number fields. Um, arithmetic groups associated to these kind of uh, uh, algebraic groups. And it's, we're going to focus on low dimensional cases, so small, um, very small number fields. But we want to, from a computational point of view, those uh, low dimensional cases, like k uh, equals q or k equals imaginary quadratic, which have appeared at the end, uh, end of um, Graham's talk. So they're, from a computational point of view, they're not, they're well known, well understood how to compute with them efficiently and all that. So we, we're going to talk about computational aspects a little bit, but uh, we want to focus more on connections with number theory. So what can you do with those computational tools? What are they, you know, what kind of experiments you can carry out? And uh, we'll talk about some connections with maybe Galois representations, torsion growth problem, and uh, Aurel will go into actually inner forms. So you'll look at GL1 over quaternion algebras, uh, over number fields, and um, He's going to also talk about some uh, functoriality, mod p functoriality, uh, Jacques Langdon's uh, transfer um, from a computational point of view. Right, um, so I was supposed to write all that down, but I'll just. <laughs> okay, so um, um, we're going to start, I guess, with, with the classical case. So I want to revisit uh, the classical case and um, point out some of the aspects that I want to talk about in the more general case. Uh, so let's go back to the uh, classical case. All right, so what I have is I'm, I got my modular group and take my finite index subgroup. Typically, though, um, what you want to look at is the so-called Hecke subgroup. So this is the, I mean, most of this gram already introduced. These are very nice type of congruent subgroups. It won't be, I guess, it's going to be, of course, important. What's the ambient Lie group here? So uh, for technical reasons, you know, it's better to use not SL2R, but for um, gl 2 plus R positive, so the connected part with GL2 is better for automorphic forms connections and Galois representations, and you take a connected component. Right, so we want to, as we have, I guess, um, explained by Graham, so you act on hyperbolic plane. So there is a geometry involved, of course, in all this, hyperbolic plane. In general, for GL2, when you switch to number fields, it's just going to be copies of hyperbolic plane and hyperbolic free space, really. Nothing, um, those kind of product spaces we'll be more looking at. And we want to, um, so the, yeah, so we, geometric speaking, when you look at this, this discrete guy X properly discontinuously on, on this hyperbolic plane, and the quotients are nice hyperbolic twofolds. finite volume. And it is uh, non-compact. Because I have parabolic elements here, they fix points at infinity, so you're going to have cusps. So this is as, as Graham drew the picture, so you're going to have some heavy genus. So they all have basically punctures, which geometrically speaking, these punctures are cusps reaching out to infinity with uh, so the diameter is getting more narrow and narrow. And the cross sections are circles. It looks better when I draw this on my notebook, but uh, yeah. Right, so 
there is only really one degree that you would like to uh, look in cohomology. So it's going to be degree one. So I'm going to actually stick to group cohomology. So what we want to focus on, so the, at the center of these lectures will be cohomology of these, these arithmetic groups. So we want to consider cohomology of gamma with various coefficients. So uh, for number 30 purpose, we want heck operators. And the heck operators come from the commensurator. Uh, so what I need, so I need these modules, not just gamma modules. I'm going to need my um, commensurator elements to act on it, which is uh, GL2. So where M is the GL2 plus Q module. So the significance of this group here, as opposed to, yeah, so this was the role played by SL2Q in Graham's lectures. For technical reasons, it's better to go positive. Um, yeah, so this is the, maybe I'll just be sketchy. So this is the commensurator of my lattice. in the ambient Lie group. Yeah. Um. So right, so this is um, the elements. I guess now that I mentioned I need to define it. So all the points in my Lie, ambient Lie group, which when you conjugate your lattice by these elements, it intersects largely finite index both the conjugate and the group lattice itself. Right, OK, so um, Graham already, I guess, uh, explained the heck operators, right? So you, you, it's enough to, I guess, stick to, let's say, take prime P prime, and then you take, um, maybe I should call alpha. Uh, element in the commensurator, and then you, just for completeness sake, I'm going to write, uh, repeat what Graham already told us. So I follow this um, Right, so the, the, the coefficient module there doesn't really play a role. It's quite functorial. So you first go down from your lattice to the subgroup here by restriction. You just take your co-cycle, restrict it to the subgroup. And then here, there's an isomorphism implemented by the fact that these groups are conjugates, right? If you conjugate this group by G inverse, you get this one. So this is an isomorphism back conjugation between the two groups here and then here we use the fact that G is in the commensurator right so um, this subgroup has finite index in gamma and that allows us to do some kind of averaging to basically promote co-cycles for the small group to the big group through an averaging process this is also known as co-restriction or Transfer in group theory. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. You can be quite explicit. So there is also this the degree itself has nothing. Uh, so this works for any degree, of course. I mean, well, yeah. So yeah. So this works for any arithmetic group, really gamma and any commensurator element. Right, so this is the heck operator. So what we want to do is we want to compute these things together with the heck action. And there are lots of ways to do it. As you know, the most classical being modular symbols. 
Graham explained a, a method uh, using those factors. What I want to, I guess, uh, point out a method in a sketch terms that uses the same, uh, it's similar in the way it starts to Graham's. I mean, all these, you need some kind of um, input data. So I'm going to, so how to compute. And it's, I'm actually going to use the outcome for some theoretical purposes. Um, so yeah, so first step is I'm going to do this. Um, for uh, To compute this, I'm going to do so-called Shapiro's lemma. And I'm going to just um, turn the problem into something just involving SL to Z. Yeah. And the, the, to do that, you just need to use a coin this module. You could, um, or induce modules, finite index. I don't know if you can read that. But uh, a concrete implementation of that would be really, um, depending on what kind of uh, ring you're working over, so I'll just put it R. It could be Z, it could be the complex numbers, it could be a finite field, that ring which, that you're operating over. So you just take the uh, cosets. So let me, yeah, I, I'm using G here, right? That's why I put, okay, I'll use G. So you can just either see this as functions uh, from your group to the uh, module that are kind of gamma invariant, or dually you can just take the um, free, you know, the vector space generated by or the module generated by the cosets and tensor that with M. That also works. It's kind of a different perspective. So uh, you just uh, change. Uh, this is called yeah Ekman Shapiro lemma, I guess. Ekman, Brun, uh, Ekman also had it, but it's mostly known as Shapiro lemma. Uh, lemma. One way is trivial. Like it's an isomorphism going from here to there. Is really you have a cos cycle valued in here, and once you get down here, you just evaluate that identity to get here. So it's it's well known. So okay, so this is Hecke equivariant. This map. And I'm not going to go into detail. So two places where you can read about this is, um, I believe it should be in the, it's a great paper of Ash and Stevens from 1986 in Crele uh, paper. They have really a lot of goodies about cohomology of arithmetic groups in there. And um, how is this going to work? Oh, I don't know what to do now. If I. If I pull this down, it's going to be too high for me. If I pull this up, you won't see the board. Don't know what to do. Um, I'll maybe keep it down, and I'll just bend down. Okay. Yeah, another place, maybe it's not quite well known, but I really uh, love uh, st this guy's stuff. So, Xiang Dong Wang from early 90s. He has some papers where it makes everything extremely explicit. Um, this is a student of Harder, from one of his early students. And he was a postdoc at the uh, Institute for Experimental Mathematics in Essen when he was led by uh, Fry in the 90s. So there was a lot of uh, postdocs and a lot of experiment, uh, computational number theory going on there. So in some, see some of his papers. It's quite everything's done homologically. It's really nice. Extremely explicit. OK, so yeah, so the first step is don't worry about what kind of uh, subgroup you're working with. Just consider the full modular group with co induced modules. And um, next, I still need some, some input. Well, we're going to get a geometric input. Um, the second step is um, you can either, let me pass to PSL2Z for, to make things slightly simple. Um, you could either do, yeah, so you take this uh, free product description of PSL2Z. Uh, it's a free product given by you know those uh, two elements um, 
let me write it as yeah, A and B, I guess. So this is order two, right? Um, and this is order three. Ooh, I always get this wrong. Um, is it something like this? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you can. This can be derived algebraically, I guess, completely algebraically. But um, uh, it's best done geometrically, as uh, this is the cubic graph. That uh, I like that cubic graph uh, terminology. So you you look at. There are different ways of getting that cubic graph. One is through uh, deformation retract, as as um, as Graham mentioned. So you tessellate a prof plane using your fundamental domain, right? Um, let me get that wrong. And um, what you can do is, no, I'm getting this wrong. So you can, um, once, okay, let me do the tessellation. You, what you can do is, I, uh, you can take the dual tessellation, so taking, you know what, this, um, you could either do, Um, you can contract along geodesics. So you look at all the rational points at, um, at, uh, on, the, on the boundary. And given, so what you want to do is you, can, you want to retract equivariantly any point in the, in the upper plane using geodesics. So you can use geodesics to take any point and retract then along geodesics line through these uh, cusp points. And what you're going to end up with is the tree that Graham was talking about. Or alternatively, I guess this is what uh, this lattice uh, methods people uh, like to look at. So you can take an ideal triangle to tessellate, and then take the dual tessellation. Uh, dual would be you take uh, centers of, uh, yeah, so it, it, it goes the same way. Anyway, so um, if you want to work with PSL too, so what you really want to do is, I guess, put the middle point here, I, because remember, this guy flips, right? So you can then take that little branch here, little segment. So the stabilizer of this guy would be the order three guy. Stabilizer of I will be just this guy, which flips, as Graham said. And the stabilizer of this little arc will be just identity, this edge. So this description then it follows from you know um, Sarah's book on trees that you have this <coughs> free product description, and from there then you can jump onto a long, uh, long exact sequence for cohomology. Uh, which could be seen as a Meyer Viatoris sequence, I guess. A great source for this stuff and uh, some of the stuff that's coming up is uh, Gabor's lecture notes, Gabor Wieses. I learned a lot of stuff from Gabor's writings. Uh, lecture notes, it's on the archive. So this is all done um, in great detail. He proves it algebraically, this one, this free product. He does it algebraically. But so we get a sequence on cohomology, a long exact sequence. So it goes something like um, M. Let me call this guy G1. Or maybe I won't do that. OK, I'll need to introduce more um, G. So these are the H0 groups, right, in the invariance. This is m to the identity, essentially. That's the stabilizer of the edge, which is trivial. So there's a trivial group there. Uh, I shouldn't use m for this, right? It's not m anymore. It's this co-induced module. Now let me call this n, huh? So yeah, we're not using the original coefficient system m that was for the lattice. We are using co-induced module. And um, yeah, so this goes to well, 
also there's for higher degrees you get because the finite these are finite groups so you get something like this um, you know what I'm not interested in finite groups one word, uh, the higher degrees I'm not interested in anyway so let's just stop here save some time right so okay um, there is a, so this works for trivial z coefficients or so it's coefficient is really arbitrary what I want to do is if you if you if 2 and 3 are invertible these are the size of the torsion groups right 2 and 3 are invertible in my base ring which was that little r I only mentioned it once I guess that's the r that my module is on for example if it's like complex numbers if you over the complex numbers then these guys are finite because they're finite groups in order 2 and 3 will vanish and so what you're going to get is then, or it could be fp with p greater than 3, then you will have this description. So this g generally will act, uh, so this is going to be trivial. It's going to be nothing fixed by the whole group. And so what you're going to get is h1 gn is a morphic 2. Um, and caution out by the, this is an injection now, by the image fixed by, these are the um, elements in your module fixed by B, and these are the sub-module of elements fixed by A. Okay. So, this is quite robust because um, the, so in a sense, instead of Extending your, uh, what's that? Uh, so uh, Graham was going for a bigger complex, CW complex, on which the group was acting up, was acting nicely. As opposed to that, I'm just uh, keeping the, keeping my little arc and making my coefficient system bigger. Uh, that's, I mean, from a complex device, I guess it's more or less the same. Um, and remember, so just as a note, for I mean, in the case of interest, that for example, if you gamma note of n, the coset representatives, um, the coset space can be identified with projective line over the rings that over n z. So I I implementation is usually nice for this kind of uh, subgroup. The coset space is nicely, and the action of g on the cosets is really matrix acting on the projective line with that over that ring so it's quite convenient and yeah so that's so annoying right that noise so what we have is that um, well in terms of heck operators another good thing happens what's behind it uh, we just the hacker action here is now implemented by, so okay, so this is the original thing I was considering, right? And then I have this. Uh, so the heck operators, if you want to transfer the action of heck operators, you get something quite nice actually, action of heck operators. This, is, uh, this has been done going back to, I guess, Merel, Loic Merel. And uh, Cremona also worked on this, uh, simplified some of Merrell's stuff. This is uh, what we call but Heilbronn matrices. For any given P, to implement the action of TP, transfer the action of TP on the left to here, what you do is you compute these so-called Heilbronn matrices, a bunch of matrices. What should I call them? Uh, using continued fractions, so everything is simple. And you just basically um, take these matrices and make it act on N, you know, their matrices acting on this module, and they will stabilize this subspace, and there you go, that's, that's extremely efficient. And um, in, in modular symbols, yeah, go ahead. A, a bunch of matrices. A bunch of matrices. So these are called the Heilbronn matrices. Uh, that's what Cremona calls them. 
So these are two by two matrices that are computed uh, uh, by the continuous fractions algorithm using only P. So it's a kind of a, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, you have a geodesic and you want to use continuous al fractions algorithm to implement it. It's going like from the modular symbols to unimodular symbols, it's very similar, that kind of stuff. And um, in the modular symbols uh, terminology, this is what some people call as M symbols, actually, after Manin, M symbols. Yeah, so this is, um, you know, modular symbols is essentially a compact supported uh, homology. And this is kind of a left shed duality going back to the cohomology. So it's really the same thing. So this, these are the M symbols uh, in the module. Okay, so, all right, so there's, there's, that's just another way of computing the cohomology. Now, let's make some deductions. I want to look at uh, dimension. So one thing you can, from this description is you can read off the dimension um, nicely. First, as, as Graham said, um, there are certain coefficient modules that are of interest for automorphic forms that you put in there. Uh, put, well, let me say VK, VK minus 2 over R. So I'll just define this as two variable matrices, uh, so polynomials over the ring R, uh, homogeneous of degree K minus 2, homogeneous polynomials. This is dual to the symmetric power representation. It's dual. So we can just take this one. And the action is as, as Graham defined, the action of uh, the matrices. And uh, Eichler-Shimura isomorphism should be mentioned. So this is, a, I read in one of uh, Nicola Bergeron's writing that it actually goes to Poincaré, back to Poincaré for 1905. Nicola is a big lover of Poincaré, so it's, he has done a lot of stuff. Goes back even before uh, Eichler and Shimura. So, um, so, the, so yeah, so these, if you take these coefficients, these are the representations, uh, finite dimension representations of the, of the Lie group, I mean Lie group. So if you take those, um, the C coefficients, then you get your space of modular forms, right, as Graham said. So this is where the connection to uh, automorphic forms lies in. And uh, the actual map is quite simple. You this can be also read uh, explicitly in Gabor's uh, lecture notes. Of course, it's done by, fully done in Shimura's uh, book. So if you have um, FC, this is your uh, modular form on the upper half plane, yeah? So you cook up this holomorphic modular form, um, let's say belonging to here. So you cook up, a, uh, at least, yeah, so you cook up, a, okay, I'm gonna have to, uh, a vector valued modular, a vector valued differential form, it's a vector value differential form. And you just integrate that. If you, well now how do you get that co-cycle? Given uh, uh, gamma one, uh, gamma. So the co-cycle, let me call it F tilde, uh, sends gamma to integral uh, of tau to gamma tau of this this guy, up to maybe uh, some normalization factor. So you in, you're integrating over over a the, the, the tau is a fixed point in the upper half plane. Uh, fixed, it doesn't really quite matter because it's a holomorphic uh, uh, differential form. It's independent of the path. So you just go from tau to gamma tau. So you, over this little uh, geodesic, you integrate the uh, form and you get a polynomial which is valued in here. So that gives you 
They satisfy the core cycle rule. Right, and now using this identity, we can uh, get a dimension formula for the left-hand side. With a little understanding of this then tells you, gives you a dimension formula for the space of modular forms. And uh, how do you see the, let's go back to that um, quotient. So, I got H1, let me go to gamma naught of uh, N uh, with coefficients in VK minus 2C. Now this is, uh, oh, okay. Um, it's gonna be too much to write, so let me, let me call this, um, this N is not the same N, okay, so I, Ns are confusing, but let me call A to be the core in this module, which in this case is gonna be the projective line over this ring, tensored by the module, original module I have. So it's gonna be A quotient out by AC2 plus fixed AC3. So the idea is, obviously the dimension of uh, this is, vector space generated by the project line. Um, right, so dimension of A is this times, dimension of this times that. So what's, this is, um, this is essentially, this is exactly the index, right? This is, a, yeah, this is just the index. The dimension of this is the index because this, this, this is the coset space. And um, this one is uh, polynomials, it's gonna be K minus one. Uh, this guy plus one, and uh, right, so that's the dimension. And dimension of this, this is an involution, so it's gonna be half. So let me give this a name, huh, D. Or maybe I shouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah so this is half. And this is one third, rough, um, roughly speaking, of course. Um, this is, so what you get then is you're taking one half and one third out. So that's one sixth. So that's the uh, rough estimate. Maybe I should put this. So the dimension is essentially one sixth of the uh, index times the and the size of the coefficient system you're using. And from this we make just two observations that will be, uh, we're gonna ask the generalizations of those two observations very soon. Is there a clock here? Okay. Um, when, how much time do I have? 25. That's good. Okay. Thank you. So two obvious observations. If I, um, if I fix my lattice and vary the weight system, two observations. Uh, yeah, yeah, so one, if we fix gamma, then uh, Dimension gamma k minus two c grows linearly in the dimension of v k minus two, which is uh, essentially k. And if you can also do another thing, you can uh, fix the weight system and vary your level group. This is sometimes called the level group for the automorphic representing of, of, for the form. If you fix k, then dimension grows linearly in the index. Index. Okay. Can I ask you some questions about this? Yes, please.
Yeah, they three will intersect. In the end, right? Because you might have a fixed point. Of yeah, so this will. So this will maybe just be plus there or something? In general, it should be plus, of course. That's, there's, there could be a kernel. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I guess very general speaking. OK, so. Um, oh, so you're saying that that kernel vanishes. Uh, I think I should, well, am I? I mean, definitely, it certainly vanishes for these coefficient systems that I wrote, wrote down here for automorphic forms purposes. But you're right. In the very abstract case, is this still true that it's vanishing? Um, yeah, let me just do this. But yeah, if you look at Gabor's lecture notes, he has more details. He covers every little uh, corner. So I think you're going to have your answer there. Uh, I, I, if I remember, it vanishes, but yeah, sure. Okay, so, right. Um, now, I'm going to talk about, so what, what's the um, one, so uh, again, connections to number theory. We talked about connections with automorphic forms. One thing you can do with forms together with the heck operators, action of heck operators is there is a kind of a, um, generalization uh, kind of uh, developed by Langlands, I guess, or initiated by Langlands, which uh, can be seen as a non-abelian extension of class field theory. So you you can use modular forms to parameterize non-abelian extensions of Q, just like class field theory is used for abelian extensions of Q. So you can use that's one of the things about Langlands program. Um, maybe I'll say. Long lens, non-abelian class field theory. So, very roughly speaking, what you can do is a, kind of a bridge between extensions L over Q, Galois, with an embedding of the Galois group into GL2 FQ, whereas Q is a P power. So if you fix a prime P. Um, why is it I'm only considering Galois groups that Im embed in GL2? Uh, because I'm really working with GL2 right now on the modular form side. In general, if you use modular forms attached to some algebraic group G, you will want to land in the so-called Langlands dual group, which is determined by the uh, data of that uh, algebraic group. But for, for us, it's going to be simple, GL2. Um, right, so these guys will be, are in connection. So this is a very loose, wiggly one. With, uh, so what you can do is mod P reductions of eigenvalue systems of uh, eigenvalue systems captured in cohomology. Captured. Maybe I should just say eigenvalue systems of uh, forms. forms in SK gamma. So the gamma varies, depends on the uh, conductor of this mod P Galar representation. And, but it, there is a, so, and the weight, weight could be, I guess, bounded up to uh, P plus one because we're working, working with fixed P here. But the, the, what's the connection like? So. So if you, if you have an eigenvalue system, let's say you have a um, weight k modular form, you hit it, it says eigen form. So you, when you hit it with echo operators, you'll collect um, these uh, eigenvalues. These eigenvalues a priori are complex numbers, a complex vector space. But actually, our cohomology interpretation already shows that these are algebraic integers. Why? Because it's actually something that's quite important.
I should have thought about this. It's something that should be stressed about uh, the benefits of using cohomological perspective for automorphic forms. Um, so if you look at polynomials with, let's say, z coefficients, this becomes, a, this is a um, z module that sits, I guess we can um, embed it. So let's say there's an, by tensoring by C, it gives you a lattice, the image of this, there might be some torsion here, very small torsion in this uh, Z module, but uh, killing the torsion, you're going to get a lattice in the complex cohomology. And the heck operators, they stabilize this lattice. Because as you said, uh, the construction of the heck operator is really, it's really, it doesn't care about the module that you use. So, so all these um, heck operators, they're commuting matrices, and they're uh, stabilizing a lattice. So it means that up to some change of basis, uh, you can make them all integral. Then it means that all the characteristic polynomials are, uh, we have coefficients in Z, which means all these uh, algebraic, uh, so the eigenvalues are algebraic integers. Then choosing a nice uh, prime ideal in the, uh, in the number field that they live in, you can reduce them mod P. So that you get um, f, 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 f p bar numbers. And then what you do is, so if you have an extension like this, you take Frobenius elements, send them in there. Let me give this a name, rho. Send them in here. They're matrices now. You can take the trace. Now that's an f q number. So what I want, uh, the connection is that this number is that number for almost all primes. For except finite many primes, you can just. Yeah, this is long lens reciprocity. So I'm, I'm just doing it mod p. Yeah. yeah. So this um, going from right to left is essentially what you're doing is uh, you're, uh, this, this is the same thing as looking at the periodic color representation associated to your modular form and then reducing that mod p. Uh, that essentially gives you that color representation. So the going from right to left is due to, so this going from modular forms to the Galois side is um, I guess it's also Eichler Shimura for weight 2 and Delin for higher weights. And then you, so this associates periodic color representations to your Hecke eigen forms and then reduce them more P to get this kind of more P color representation. And going from left to right was a conjecture of Serre, Serre's conjecture, which was, of course, settled by uh, Carre and with, with Wantan Barger, or did I say that wrong? Wantan Barger. Right. So we're going to be also keeping an eye on this connection when we consider things not over Q anymore, but over K. So, right, any, any questions so far? Um, Oh, it's the same. P I'm using the same P. Oh, sorry about that. It should be, an, uh, usually stay away from this P. Um, maybe I'll keep this P here. Maybe take oops, L. L is not P. It's not the same P. Yes. Thank you. And on the, the right-hand side, it's pretty much the reduction of the Mod L reduction. I, yeah, so this is, um, you take an ideal L. Yes, this is, I'll call it mod L reduction. So what happens is that these algebraic numbers, they generate a finite number, a number field. And in that number field, you choose a prime ideal over sitting over a hell, and you can use that. 
to reduce these algebraic integers. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really, I'm not. Um, Well, um, so these modular forms gave you rise to, a, as you said, a compatible system of theoretical representations. But um, I'm, I'm fixing the P that I want to work with. So I'm just focusing on one of those members of the family to reduce, to get something mod P, yeah. Mod L, yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm using, I mean, yeah, so the existence, so these guys give you the whole family, right? Uh, I'm just using the elided one. This one, yeah. So it works for every L. Yeah. This, but I just fix my L. Right. So as so, it's a way of so the idea is these mod p reductions of eigenvalue systems coming from mod p information, uh, coming from modular forms, can be seen as uh, parameterizing non-abelian uh, uh, extensions with a specific type of Galois groups. Yeah. This this will be odd because it's coming from these guys, yeah. Unless it's two, uh, this two, yeah. There is no other two, yeah. Yeah. So this is a very, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I think I'm ready to slowly move now to uh, make things more interesting by going into Bianchi modular forms or Bianchi groups. As Graham says, so you, one way to make SL2Z more interesting is to either, yeah, either you can say SLN, make things bigger, uh, the matrices, or you can make the ring, coefficient ring bigger, right? So let's, let's go for um, imaginary quadratic fields now. D square free positive integer. And I'm going to use the so-called Bordeaux notation. This is the ring of integers of uh, K. And I'm going to take my modular group now over this ring. And this is what's known as a Bianchi group, named after uh, Luigi Bianchi. Going back to 1892. Maybe 10 years after Klein studied the classical modular group and subgroups, there is actually a special case of the, if you look at SL2Z brackets I, actually that goes back to Picard uh, some couple of years maybe earlier. But anyway, so these groups act. Now, what's the ambient Lie group here? Well, you have to consider them in SL2C. This is more or less the same thing as GL2C, because C is algebraically close, so when you take the project, PSL2C and PGL2C are isomorphic. So, uh, so okay, so let's, but yeah, okay, I can actually, why not, let's do it inside GL2C. So this is the isometries, orientation preserving isometries, well up to maybe uh, taking the projector quotient of hyperbolic three space. Um, this, this is very similar, going from two to three, the same hyperbolic geometry, and um, the action, if you want to write it, so one convenient model is the upper half, uh, upper half of the R3. Right, so you can take um, C plus, C times R plus, Z and R, and as Graham said, uh, a convenient way of e explicating the action is you embed this into Hamiltonians. So 
So this is Hamilton's quaternions with the i and j and k, just the usual relations. And then the action would be, <clears throat> yeah, so a, b, c, d acting on, let's say, q viewed as a Hamilton's quaternion will be a, q plus b times uh, c, q plus d. You take the inverse in the Hamiltonians. And you can make this go back to the definition, the explication in terms of z, the horizontal location and the height location, using a splitting of the Hamiltonians into matrices. And you can get the usual complicated formula. Um, you can, uh, so you can uh, lead to, to the usual, let me, we might say usual, but complicated formula in terms of Z and R. I won't write it down. We, d we don't really need all that. Um, right, so um, now I'm going to just uh, go over what we've done with the PSL2Z using that tree. Now you can do the same thing for Bianchi groups, at least the small ones can be done really by hand. So, um, so these are, so there are two dimensional CW complexes. That uh, PSL, uh, SL2, that K act on cellularly and co-finitely. Um, here's an example. This is the same example that Graham gave, um, right? So you get take the sphere and uh, take the tube over it and see the part that it touches the sphere on the top. There's a rectangle there. Uh, so if you take the same tessellations, uh, and then you can do a, again uh, re reduct, uh, do get deformation retract onto it using the geodesics. And so that will be CW complex, I'll call it C, and your PSL2 ZK, let me call it G, X on it, cofinitely. And for, for the case of maybe PSL2 ZI, this is the one I've been, I draw over there. Uh, so this the fundamental domain, fundamental, that will be single cell and when you take the, for the fundamental domain. So this is going to be a two cell, four edges, four vertices. And it looks like, uh, so the edge stabilizers are I think something like this. Vertex stabilizers are D2. Uh, I'm going to mess this up now. Something like this. So these are all these finite groups, stabilizers of the edges. And the face itself is stabilizers identity. And as Graham said, so this leads to a uh, recursed, uh, so amalgamated free product description. A4 over C3. This is amalgamated over C3, S3. And the other one is the bottom guy, S3, C2. D2. And these two guys are amalgamated over a copy of PSL2Z. Like this. And just like that aviatory sequence uh, that we used uh, from that fundamental uh, edge um, to get the cohomology long exact sequence, there is a spectral sequence that does the same thing uh, from this kind of geometric data can use a spectral sequence to compute cohomology. I sh shouldn't forget to um, mention, so this, this is done, I guess, first done by Mendoza, Eduardo Mendoza, student of um, Harder, again from the uh, uh, 90s, I think from Philippines. Um, Fritz Grunewald once told me that actually he after he quit mathematics, he went to, he was, became like CEO of uh, 
Microsoft or Coca-Cola for Europe branch. So it was quite well, apparently. Uh, anyways, uh, so Mendoza, at around the same time, Flöge did uh, some kind of spine constructions like this for Bianchi groups. And the notion here actually goes uh, back to kind of Siegel's notion of uh, distance to the cusp, which is, was Uh, this, uh, I think, was done for SL2 over total real fields by, uh, by Siegel in his lectures uh, in some Tata Institute, I think. And then Harder generalized this to algebraic groups over number fields or, or function fields quite generally to using this notion. Yeah, I say. Uh, uh, Mendoza computed with the five Euclidean. He did spines for, so this deformation retracts for d equals 1, 2, 3, 5, 7 for PSL2 and PGL2. Yeah. And Flöge did several others. I don't quite uh, not remember the details of what Flöge did, but it's, some of this overlaps with Flöge's work. And I should just say, say, say if you want to read about this, uh, um, a good place is uh, Karen Walkman and uh, Schwerner's paper from 80s. They used that spectral sequence I'm telling you about uh, to get from this data, geometric data, to explicit computations of cohomology. So there is a, a spectral sequence that computes H i gamma m, um, I guess I should say g, but then you can use Shapiro's lemma again to go to any gamma subgroup. And um, for us, if you apply that for, um, for example, uh, again, sticking to PSL2 zi, that's on the board, um, h1, h2, let's go for, you need the top, you use kind of c top homological dimension here with this method. It's modular symbols, essentially. Uh, you see, I say, gamma naught of an ideal n with um, here the coefficient systems have, uh, there are two copies, c, x, y, uh, k minus 2. You can use l as well. Um, they don't have to be the same size, c, x, y, l minus 2. So the representations of, um, so you need to look at the complex points of your algebraic group. If your underlying algebraic group is fancy G, then you look at the complex points, which will be GL2C times GL2C for us, because we're working with an imaginary quadratic field. So each copy of GL2C, will you'll need a, these homogeneous polynomials. And so you have these two, and the action will be complex conjugated. You have, and you have A, B, C, D, X on this in the usual way, and X on the second copy with complex conjugation in each variable, each coordinate. So this is, these are the modules that you need for seeing automorphic forms. But anyway, so if you do this, then uh, this spectral sequence will give you N divided by N A plus N B so as, as uh, Peter said now, this is not direct sum. They have intersections, actually, which is the N, D. What's A, B, C, D? They are the edge stabilizers here. Order two and three guys. So you get the same kind of so-called M symbol uh, description of H2. Remember, so this is, again, this is really modular symbols, which C is compactly supported homology. So we're doing left shift duality, going into cohomology, top degree cohomology. And this is the M symbols description of that H2. Um, it's the same. Here, N is the co-induced module. I didn't write, but N is the co-induced. And the complication here is that, you know, it's not a direct sum like before in the so that these individual pieces are simple. It's like half the dimension, half the dimension, one third, one third. 
but they have intersections. And I tried for hard long years ago, try to control the dimensions of those in triple intersections are the problems. Fritz Grunewald tried a long time ago. He encouraged me to try again. Uh, it's just there is no way. It's, you cannot really get a formula for this, uh, the, how the intersections work. So this brings me to one of the most, uh, I guess, mysterious things about Bianchi modular forms. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, well, or the cohomology of Bianchi groups. I, let me. Uh, there is no dimension formula, uh, unlike the case of classical modular forms. We did some kind of quite innocent generalization, but then uh, you have no control over the dimensions. In fact, if you do, well, that formula allows you to implement it on a computer and experiment, of course. Um, if you look at uh, dimensions of um, H1, H2, gamma naught, let's say with prime level, prime ideal, split prime ideal, so norm of the ideal is a prime. So you say P is a prime ideal. And let's just look at let's see, trivial C coefficients. The dimension is equal to 1 for 90% of all the prime ideals up to norm like 50,000 or something. Or 45,000. It's been a long time since I computed that thing. So this is quite a contrast. So the dimension doesn't grow. So this dimension being one just means that it comes from the that, uh, cusp. There are two cusps. Then you have prime level, gamma naught of p. The three manifold will have only two cusps. And uh, there will be a single dimensional contribution to h2. So this is all Eisenstein uh, the, coming from the boundary of that Borel-Sert compactification, which means there is no cuspidal cohomology. So trivial cuspidal cohomology for 90% of the time up to very long uh, dimension uh, levels. So this is quite uh, mysterious. So the big, one of the big problems is no dimension formula. OK, I, I'm sensing that my time is up. Yeah, yeah, OK. This is where I'm going to leave it. So we're going to now ask the next question. Uh, what if we look at asymptotic behavior? Remember earlier I said, well, there was an explicit formula for the dimension, but you could interpret it. If you fix gamma level uh, and vary the weight, it varies in linearly in the weight dimension of the weight. And if you, could, if, you can, uh, if you fix the weight and vary the level group gamma, it uh, varies linearly in the index. So you can ask the same kind of questions in this situation. That's where I'm going to uh, continue from on my Mondays. Uh, that will be online. Yes. All right. Thank you for your time. Um, let's go eat.